It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show, recorded live every other Wednesday or so at the Ann Arbor District Library, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, writing comics, drawing comics, designing characters, building worlds, uh, workflow, the, the lifestyle of the cartoonist, comics advocacy, all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist, and with me today... Is Dave Carter returning to the show? Dave hey, Carter, Jersey. Thank you. Of uh, the a librarian at the University of Michigan Video Game Archive. Yes. So um, amongst the things I do there is I s select comics, and I'm this comic specialist for the university library. And you've been on the show a bunch of times. And uh, I'm always grateful to have you. Oh, thank you. Um, but this may be somebody's first show, so I want to describe for the audience what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Because as I was thinking about it, I was like, and I may have said this before, but you're living the dream of almost every 12-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Including 12-year-old Dave. Let's, <laughs> let's put that out. <laughs> so what is it that you do? I mean, like a video game archive, what does that mean? So, so um, I run the uh, video game archive at the University Library. So we have, uh, it's, it's a room in the basement of the Duderstadt Center on North Campus where we've got 6,000 uh, games and over 60 different gaming systems. And you can come in and use and play the games down in there. Um, mm -hmm. All in the service of supporting teaching and research at the University of Michigan. Of course. Of course. <laughs> So the only thing that we need to add, well, and and you manage the comics collection. And I manage the comics collection there. And I got to say, I mean, I go there on a semi-regular basis just to read, mm -hmm. and the, the collection there is astonishingly good. I mean, you have really good taste as a selector. Oh, uh, golly, but, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, I mean, like I can find like really out-of-the-way rare Eddie Campbell stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you can find like like any, uh, you know, um, uh, Eric Talbot or any like artist who, you know, did like a lot of important work 20 years ago, you can find that, that seminal work they it, did. Because it's my formative years in, <laughs> <laughs> in comics. <laughs> Oh, I mean, it's the advantage of, of you know, a library is yeah. that we can keep stuff around, whereas, you know, your comic stores are not necessarily going to keep that on the shelf for 20 years. Well, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and you guys library bind them. Right. So they're, so they're preserved against the elements. A, right? a little bit, yeah. Well, <laughs> so, well more so than just like, you know, laminating right. a, a, a trade paperback cover, right? Yeah, right? We, we, we destroy the collectability all, all in the service of... Uh, Long term preservation. I, I and I love going to see my friends' books at Library Bound. That is so I don't know, there's something so satisfying about seeing like Dave Roman's Astronaut Academy with Library Binding. Like, yeah. It makes me so happy. It, it uh, makes it like a permanent thing. It does. It does. It feels like now it's for the ages. Right. 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 Um, so the only thing that's missing from your job description is eating candy. Right? I, it's like Pop Rocks has to be part of the job description. And then Which uh, I will point out there's a candy dish in my office. <laughs> <laughs> that I feel on some semi regular you basis. You have Laffy Taffy and Fruit by the Foot and all the things. That <laughs> <laughs> couch oh, all, the, all that sugar stuff. Ah. Uh, but anyway, thanks for coming back because we're going to talk about Band Books Week. Indeed. So uh, I, I I have a feeling this will be a little bit more of a serious episode than what we typically right. do on Comics Are Great. P perhaps a little less family friendly than than typical. Well, I mean, yes. We, 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 I mean, we're not going to be dropping f bombs like Kevin Smith podcast, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we're going to be talking about heavy stuff. Right. Right. So um, because we're going to be talking about censorship, we're going to be talking about uh, the why it's an issue, if it's an issue. Mm -hmm. Right. We're going to debate it out because like when, I, I got a, a a review of the show. From Chris Chris Schweitzer, uh, Krugan Adventures, uh, he said that like, one of the things he loves about the Comics Are Great show is that I make a concerted effort to turn every episode into a philosophical debate, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that was like the, one of the nicest things I ever heard because that is something that I take very seriously. It's like like if we're going to talk about this, let's talk about it like like really look at it from every angle, mm -hmm. not just like come at it from our particular perspective. Right, right. Because uh, you and I could could. Agree on this for hours. Yeah, yeah, we really could. Uh, and, and and this is something that I, I put in my notes, uh, which we can get to in a second. Is that like this? We both live in Ann Arbor, where there is a bit of a a cultural uh, you know homogenization here in 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 terms of political leanings, right? <laughs> Uh, one could put it that way. One could put, I'm trying to find a delicate way to say it, but you know, it's like we, we 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 wear one of the colors, or culturally speaking, on on the uh, on the spectrum of uh, politics, right? Right. Um, and so, as a result, like when you say censorship, eh, people are gonna, gonna be in pretty much agreement here. But the whole thing is that 
across the country, there's different cultures, different subcultures, and different attitudes and morals, and so this and, thing is an issue nationally, even in the continent, right? Right. And censorship is a, it's a spectrum of, of things. I mean, right. it, it, they call it Banned Books Week, but it's really meant to be not just about banning books, but about the entire conversation around um, different different ways that people try to control access of others. Uh, mm-hmm. To 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 uh, books in, in particular and media in, in general, and the interesting angle for us and why we're bringing it to the comics are great show. I mean, it's an important issue regardless, but there's an interesting wrinkle in this in that ALA put a special focus on graphic novels for this year's Banned Books Week. Right, right. That's very new. I mean, like this is the first time, yeah? Um, I believe so. I, they're working in conjunction with the CBLDF on uh, making this a, sort of a comics and graphic novels theme to this year's Banned Books The Week. Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Correct. Could, could you bring us up to speed on what that organization is and where it came from just like in a, in a minute? Is oh, it golly. possible? Um, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund is kind of like the ACLU for comics. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so they um, they def- they um, they contribute to efforts for promoting um, f- free access to comics, and they uh, provide legal defense uh, for retailers and and creators and and others who have and libraries and whoever um, who have found themselves on the wrong end of of the law when it comes to when it comes to uh, the comics that they want to produce and sell. I remember reading a story. This would be like ten years ago mm-hmm. of a comic store. In, I think it was Texas, and they had adult comics, meaning like comics with adult themes and right. imagery, right? Uh, behind the shelf, mm-hmm. out of reach of the general public. You had to ask for it to get it. Two undercover, two plainclothes police people came in and and asked for the comic. The retailer gave it to them. They bought it, and then the guy was taken to court for selling obscene materials. Right, right, right. Or I think they might have sent. Did they send a kid in or something? I I'm, I'm, I conflate all these different stories because there's various okay. permutations on this that, that happen well, throughout. Well, in the article that I've seen, and this is where I'm not doing my due diligence by actually digging up the story, but <laughs> the, the way I remember it is, is that, and this is why the, the C, uh, Comic Book Legal Defense, Defense Fund got involved, is that it was it was actually adults who bought it. Right, right. It was out of reach of young people. You had to be an adult to get it. But then in the in the courtroom, the prosecuting attorney's crowning argument was, well, that's all well and good, but as we all know, comics are for children. Right, right. And then the CBDLF <laughs> had to get involved to defend this this retailer because that's the kind of prejudices and weirdness that can happen in comics is in such a weird place, right? Because we've got all these superhero stories mm-hmm. that are trying to get more and more edgy and adult. So within the comics community, within like the the direct market comic community, there's some kinds of stereotypes of they're not for kids anymore. They haven't been for twenty years. Right. Right. But then outside of the comics community, you've got this whole thing about this is trivial kitty stuff, right. right? And so the people in the know are stuck in this weird battleground. Yeah. So twenty years, twenty thirty years ago, we're trying to say comics aren't just for kids anymore, right. and now there's like, but comics can also be for kids, <laughs> right? <laughs> Because you're making that argument all the time on, on kids with kids read comics, and right? All that kind of stuff, right? Right, right. <laughs> but but like but then there's there's also pockets of our uh, our continent where people just assume that if, if it's comics, it's for kids. And right. what do you mean you can tell stories about you know with like sexual or, uh, nature explored or or gender issues being explored? You can't do that in comics. Kids might read this. Kids might read this, right? So yeah. Um, okay, so let's go back to. I wanted to start with. I went to an event yesterday that you organized mm-hmm. on the campus of the University of Michigan. Uh, Phoebe Glockner and Jim uh, Ottaviani mm-hmm. did a, sort of an interview slash talk about Phoebe's work and Banned Books Week. And one of the things that Phoebe said that I was like, yeah, you're preaching to the choir here. Uh, I, I agree 100%. And I don't think anybody in this room disagrees with you. She says, banning books is stupid. <laughs> 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 and like, and like, I think that that's... I, I think it painted, and I'm not accusing Phoebe of this, but I think it, it, it put into relief this notion that, uh, and I'm guilty of this, uh, this notion of, well, that's dumb. Only dumb people would do that, so we don't need to pay attention to those dumb people because we know that freedom of speech is super important and just have some responsibility and, and make sure that your kids get access to the right things. And if they do get access to things you wish they didn't, that's a time for a discussion. That's a, that's a teachable moment, right? So, of course, banning books is stupid, but it happens. And there's parts of the country people are saying, like, yeah, you know, like, this is a good thing. This is a, You're protecting me, and so I want to explore I'm going to pitch at you, the librarian, the right. devil's advocate All right. kind of things. I'm Bring gonna... it on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come at it from, from – from, I tried to put myself in the, the worldview of the person who says, you know, um, uh, I need this, this, this feature of 
keeping it out of uh, our public schools, uh, keeping it away from our children, keeping it away from people who uh, maybe are impressionable, right? And you get the wrong impression about life. So first point is, is um, comics is a visual medium, dude. It is. Uh, if you show a rape in a comic, you're putting a rape right in front of my face. And you could put that in a movie, it could be over in a second. In but, a comic, it's a static image. That's right. I can sit there and linger on it forever. And if I'm a, if I'm a kid and I shouldn't see that, you're giving me all the time in the world to spend with that thing. Uh, dude, we need some kind of mechanism to protect children from these these visceral visual images. Vi- images are visceral. We understand them instantly. Mm-hmm. So Okay, I see your concern, Jersey. <laughs> Let's let's talk about let's talk about this. <laughs> so so I mean, you're absolutely right that that comics are a visual medium and they're a different kind of visual medium from from other from other sorts of media. Uh, well, photographs. I mean, that's the same. That's a similar sort of thing um, mm-hmm. where you can pause where you can pause on it. Um, so I mean, they're not unique, uh, but they're different from books and, and films and exactly the way that you're describing when yeah. you describe something in. In a book, you actually have to be reading that book to encounter to encounter That's that. That's something Phoebe was saying because, like, her you're, her, you're not going to randomly open to a page in a novel and be <laughs> shocked within within half a second because of what you're seeing on that on that page, right? Whereas uh, with a comic book, you might and you might say, "Oh, look at these drawings. There's you know all these happy drawings on of bunnies and whatever on the cover, and you open it up and the bunnies are doing sorted things on the inside, and you're like." <gasps> My child found Fritz the cat, and I am so angry about right. it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 So, um, so there's I, everything in this is context, right? Mm-hmm. It's what, uh, where did your child come across this thing? Who gave who gave it to them? How did they how did they find that? Were were you letting your child run rampant alone throughout you know throughout the entire library, and they wandered up to the adult section and they found this thing with pictures in it that you don't necessarily like. Um, there's also the context of how did that book get there in the first place? Who who made the decision to put to put this book um, in the library? Um, and then there's the is is some higher authority going to step in and make judgments, not knowing what was going on in, in that situation? So are you are you saying, um, you know, when, when you're bringing up this thing, this my, my child saw this in a comic book and I'm and I'm upset about it. Um, what is the approach you're taking? Are you running to the mayor? You know, on the city council and saying, "Look at the trash that this library is promoting in our community." Yeah, uh, are you? Yeah, co- I'm saying like you, you guys are the the bastion of you. You, you said yourself, you are protecting comics history and culture mm-hmm. through your collection. Right. You're not about lending as much as preserving. Right. Okay. Well, why are you preserving this garbage that's just meant to damage my child's mind? It's important. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, um, I can make that argument because the you know the collection that I'm building at the University of Michigan, which is intended to be a research collection, mm. and and we are we want to represent comics, you know, everything that's been produced in comics. And if you leave out these kinds of comics, you're leaving out a part of comics history um, in, in there. Um, now, I will say that we do not have everything on the open shelves. We have a storage area where we put we put more sensitive materials in there, which people can request um, people can request to view, but they're not going to just wander out and and, and see that. And that's not to say that everything that's on the shelves is is G rated. No, <laughs> no, not at, not at all. So you would, you've seen what we have out on the shelves. You probably would be shocked at some of the stuff that we have locked away down in down in storage. Okay, okay. So so, then, so let but, me but let, let me let me say that that. Um, Somebody has made that decision of what's supposed to be out there, and looking at the stand, you know, the community standards. In our case, the community is the University of Michigan. It's not necessarily the broader Ann Arbor community or the state of Michigan. But or, I can go or, there. But you, but you can. But you're an adult, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we are creating a collection for adults um, to be in there. That's a completely different environment than what you're going to find in a, in a public library, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so, so the the uh, responses and act- and reactions, and I and unfortunately we don't have one of the AADL librarians here with us, so you could put him or her on the spot <laughs> instead of me. <laughs> oh. But but we we started talking a little bit before about how um, the calls for censorship are oftentimes a reaction to a fear. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's a fear of of that uh, society is changing. Uh, and I don't like the way that society is going, uh, but here's this one thing that I can see, and I can make an effort to try to, to try to control. Yeah, uh, do you want to go into the parallel there? Because I think that was a fascinating parallel that you drew just right. before we started recording. So, so um, 
for those of you who pay attention to the comics internets out, out there, there was a a, um, a it, blog a blog post from a week or so ago. It was about a week ago. So from from the wife of a of a well known artist who was bemoaning the fact that when they go to um, to comic conventions now, they're not making as much money as they used to, and was laying the blame on cosplayers. On you know all these cosplayers are showing up. And again, it's it's a similar sort of reaction. And I, something is happening here. We're making less money. We don't know why, but we see this thing. Cosplayers are coming into the shows, so I'm going to make a correlation because human beings are excellent at making correlations, correlations and, yes. and assuming causality uh, for things that aren't necessarily there. That was Frederick Wortham, right? That right. the whole thing was correlation. Wow, all these kids are doing dangerous things. They all have comics. It must be the comics because they're everywhere. Well, after all, all kids were reading comics. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you know, there's millions. Millions of kids reading comics, and here's here are here's sixty five kids, <laughs> right, who are doing bad things, and so clearly it's you know, and what's the one thing all these kids have in common? They're reading comic comics. books. Yes. Um. So it's um. It's, well, and, and no, and that, that that's the interesting thing that I think you're to be fair, and we're talking about um an art uh, a blog post by uh, Denise Dorman, which we'll link to in the show notes, which you can read and make your own come up to your own conclusions on. But one of the things that she does, I think, is right, is she says, I observe. A phenomenon. Right. I'm, we are making less money at these shows. Question, hypothesis. Did something change in the culture of these shows that changes the way, uh, you know, that we interact with it? Okay, there's your hypothesis. So now it's time to test it. And then when you just – this is where the, the thing gets problematic is when she starts saying, well, it's these cosplayers and their selfies that are, are, are part of the problem there. Well, how do you test that? Uh, right. Did you test it? Right. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, it, it caused a lot of reaction online. But, but I think what you're also pointing out there that I think is really interesting is that yeah, a lot of these decisions, these these borderline knee jerk reactions to things, come out of a sense of fear. Right. Um, and, and when so when you're reacting to someone who's who wants you to remove something from the library for if it's a comic book or, or whatever, um, I, th I think. Or they're reacting to your work and saying, "How you're an artist? How can you possibly publish this filth that kids might that kids might read?" Yeah. Um, is, is to recognize that there is a that that there is a fear there, and and being able and trying to that, that person may not be in a place where they can discuss this rationally with you. And I think Phoebe had an excellent point when she was answering a question, which is that she is the worst person to defend her own work. It, even, be, be, yeah, because she is so emotionally tied to what to what she did and she's like once i put it out there i don't feel the need to defend it any anymore yeah um, i wrote down her exact words because i thought this was so great uh she said uh she said the act of making the book is explanation enough right right, right. um and and again in her work which which you and i have have both read is some harrowing stuff going on there mm -hmm. but it's all contextualized you know it's it's not because uh, she ran into an incident with the mayor of some town, holding up holding up her book, saying it was a manual for pedophiles. Wow. In there, and if you actually read the book, it's the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> it is not encouraging that sort of behavior at all. But that behavior is depicted rather starkly within within the pages of the book. And so, if you were just to open it up and see, like, here's this one page out of this entire book that has some some horrible awful stuff that I would not necessarily want kids to be looking at either mm -hmm. um, that um, but you miss the entire context of of, of where it happened in there okay. and I think it's very easy to do that with a comic book because as you said it's a it's one of the great things about comics is that it's like this visual you know input into the visual centers of your brain but then that's the two-edged sword right is yes. that it's very easy to misconstrue an image if you're not seeing it within the, within the larger context. I, w I want to dig at this just a little bit deeper from your perspective as a university librarian, as somebody whose job it is to preserve history. Right, right. You said there's stuff that's out of reach, and you said there's things that would probably shock me. So I'm guessing there's like possibly issues of cherry. Yes. It, it, yep, okay. yep. And things of that ilk. Right. Um, now, argument. Uh, what possible uh, research, intellectual, historical significance could straight up porn possibly have so let's say you're looking at um the cha changing attitudes towards sex through the through the 60s 70s and 80s and you could look at you could look at mainstream something like that but you might also want to look at the underground culture of the of the time and what was being what was being produced there and yeah. see you know all the underground comics that were being sold in head shops and, and things like that 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 you know 
um, people weren't necessarily saving <laughs> around yeah. like that. And you know, a a, um, a research library is just the sort of place uh, to store that stuff because today's today's trash is is tomorrow's um, uh, research interest. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's exactly. I mean, that, that, that's like my life. It's the video games. It's the comic <laughs> books. It's it's all the, all that stuff that people were just you know throwing away or shoving in their back pocket and and not caring about. Now it's thirty years later, and people are like, wow, that was a really interesting time in society. What was going on that was affecting that? How were people's art reflecting the times that they were that they were living in? So okay, well, I've what, got... what are people's attitudes towards sex? Yeah, well, no, in, in what you're pointing at too is is an acknowledgement that. Things do change, right. and the good old days are precisely that. Good old days, they can't come back necessarily, or right? weren't as good as we thought they were. Well, that too, yeah. that too, absolutely, right? It's like, uh, but but I think that 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 part of the argument for censorship that I pick up on every once in a while is like, why can't it be like it, the uh, hazy picture that I, of my childhood right. that why, I had in my head? Why can't it be like I remember childhood being? <laughs> and yeah, really, and and actually. I remember the early 80s in, in the town I lived in, like the movie theaters. They played X-rated movies at night. And like, you don't see that anymore. No, no. And, and like even like the level of violence in a lot of like the pulpy films from like the late 70s, early 80s, like that's toned down a lot nowadays. And so like when people are like, oh, why can't it be like such and such? I'm like, really? Because like, there, were, there were bits of it that were really awful. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, the fact that like it would be weird to work if you were a woman when we were little kids. Like, like your mom works really you know like <laughs> that was a weird thing and like we had to have like you know uh, Claire Huxtable show us that no you can be a professional and have children uh yeah we take that for granted now right 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 and we accept that that's a good thing uh but you know it, it's weird how we can pick and choose about that kind of okay i got i got a more uh ostensibly reasonable argument all right all right so i like the carl barks sure he's a master master storyteller uh, Donald Duck, uh, Scrooge McDuck, DuckTales, right? All that stuff. Terrific. Uh, went back and read some of those old comics. There are some depictions of minorities in those books that made me feel a little squeamish. And I'm looking at this and going, this is Donald Duck. This is for kids. And, uh, and it was for kids back in the day. And, <laughs> and, and when he was writing that, there were not parents out there, you know, saying that this is horrible for my kids to read, right? Right. But now, you know, the people are going to be saying, you know, there's, here's, like you said, there's some things that were in there that were acceptable 50 years ago that we would not consider acceptable for, for children to be looking at now. Right, 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 right. right. So, like, okay, what's the line on this? Is it a children's book? Is it an adult's book? Crap, I don't know. <laughs> And, and that's the difficulty. That's the difficulty with being a censor, right? Right. Is that is that you want to have these these guidelines that say, you know, if it if it if it's on this side it's okay and if it's on this side it's not okay. <laughs> and the real world is a lot fuzzier and, and more blurry than that and depends on and depends on context. You're yeah. going to hear me saying that a lot here yeah. <laughs> this afternoon. Context, context, context. Okay. Is it being? Pre are you just handing this to a kid and letting them go off to read it, or are you reading it with your? Are you reading it with your kid, and then that brings up an explanation of how um, you know it's not acceptable these days to to present uh, you know certain people in in such a, in such a light, but it was ex but it was considered acceptable even though it really should not have been back back in the day and you can open a dialogue um, you know with the with the kid um, and use the use this comic you know as a as an instant this entertaining uh, comic as a way to open up a dialogue about the changing attitudes um, towards races or sexes or or um, people of different orientations or, or whatever different cultures and the way that they're being way that they're being presented and and why you might not want to do that sort of thing. Um, so it's um, oh, you want me to raise my kid now too? I I want yes, I want you to raise your children, <laughs> Jersey, all of them. Oh, we're crying out loud. Uh, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> They're all across the country, folks. Uh, uh, but okay, you anticipated my next question. I don't remember. Did you say at the top of the show how many comics are in the collection at the Duderstadt? I don't know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Bigger than a bread box, more than a thousand. Oh, it's 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 several thousand. That's several fair. thousand. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to be that parent again. All right. Have you read all of them? No, I've not. How do you expect me to? I do not. <laughs> but I got to sit there and play watchdog for my kid to make sure that they don't read something I don't want them to read. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you provide no respite, no relief from being a parent, Dave. That, that, I think that's the takeaway we get today. And, and, let me point out that neither of us have children. No, it's easy for us, right? <laughs> well, let, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you an anecdote from from, sure. my, from my childhood. Um, when I was ten, eleven, twelve years old, I was a heavy reader of Mad Magazine, mm-hmm. uh, Mad Cracked, all crazy, all all those all those sorts of things. Plop. Pl- well, I, I don't think I I don't think I got to plop in, the, oh. <laughs> in, in those days. Um, but um, at, at some point, uh, my mother uh, learned from another parent about some of the content of Mad of Mad Magazine, mm-hmm. um, and most of which was going way over my head. <laughs> you sure. know that I was not I was not reading it for that content. I liked the, the funny Superman parody sort, mm-hmm. sorts of things, and there are the Sergio Oregoni stuff and, and all that. But they would make references to to sex and and and, and other sorts of things within there, and and. Um, and so my, my mother had not been closely monitoring what I what I was reading. I was a I was a bright precocious child who read everything I could get my hands on. You know, peanuts comics and novels and and and, uh, and Mad Magazine was one of the things that I read. Um, but my mother decided that I should I should probably not be reading th- these things at my level of development at that time. Um, so she, we had this talk, <laughs> yeah, and she said, you know, we're we are taking these away from you. Um, we will, um, we will pay you for these, you know, because you spent your money on these on these. Oh things. wow! So she basically refunded the the money that I had spent on these. Um, but but we would like you to not purchase and read these anymore. And so what did she not do? She did not. Um, you know, call out the pitchforks <laughs> yeah. out there. Um, but she she said that she had talked to because my friends had read that, and she talked to my you know she talked to my friends' parents about this well to make sure that they knew what sort of content was was in there. Um, but you know, for, so and for so the next two or three years, I did not buy. I was not allowed to buy any. But she didn't say you can't read any comics. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's what got me into reading reading buying Superman comics was that. I really like comics, but I couldn't buy this man magazine anymore. But look, here's Superman on the spinner rack, so let me pull that off. And I start, yeah. then that sent me way down the road. <laughs> to this day, I'm still I'm still traveling on. Um, but you know, she didn't go to the newsstands and, and wanted banned from from all the stuff. So so my mother made a decision as a parent for, for what she thought that I was was able to to read at at that at that time and what I sh- what I should do. Um, now they did not warp me. <laughs> I I like to think I'm a productive member of society. Oh, you're a librarian yeah, for crying out loud! So, but I'm a librarian for comic books and video games. Well, so some yes. people might, but uh, but you that. get to say you're a librarian, which that it, it evokes the picture, and people says like, oh, he's a grown up, right? Right. Yeah. So um so so my mother played the proper parental role mm-hmm. um in, in in that thing, and um and did not but did not want to seek did not try to censor that thing from existing you're not reading this trash right like make you inflict shame right like like judgment yeah didn't yeah did not do that and 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 didn't cast a poor light on an entire medium based on based on one instance of something yeah well and also i mean to step away from the devil's advocate box for a second uh, another thing that i think a lot of people tend to forget is that children are exposed to this stuff pretty regularly regardless of how much you intervene. Like, when I think about playground activities, and I'm not talking about sex happening on the playground, but I'm talking about sex jokes Mm -hmm. happen on the playground, bullying happens on the playground, uh, you know, like, uh, all sorts of, like, because uh, you're in this, at least in public schools. Actually, now that I think about it, I, I was next door to a Catholic school, and those kids were wild. <laughs> uh, but but like the, the, those, those kids are exposed to stuff from different arenas, and they bring it to, into this this melting pot called the, the playground. And I remember I was teaching a class once, and a kid said, um, "He's like, well, I'm not going to say that word that I'm thinking of in front of you because you're a grown up." <laughs> And I said, I know you know what that word is because you go to school. Right, yeah. <laughs> and kids say all sorts of terrible things yeah. in the playground. Yeah, the, the kids pretend that the par- that the parents don't know what they're saying. Yes. And, and the parents so the parents try to hide the language from the kids and kids try to hide the language from the parents and they're yes. both swearing like sailors. And, and, I, and I, I pointed out, I, put, I hung a lang- lampshade on it and I said like, look, you know and I know, but the unspoken contract is that we pretend that right. neither of us yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> So don't use that language in my classroom. Behave like a good kid. But I know what's going on. That's fine. Uh, but yeah, I think like a lot of people, they t- they tend to think that like the childhood is this this glorious innocent time where you're this this uh, blank sheet of paper, 
And and things can have a profound impact on you in the wrong way, right? right? You, right. Uh, if, if I had a little girl, I'd want to protect her from everything evil in the entire world, right? I would become totally Papa Bear about it. Uh, but uh, but you can't, right? Because if, if they're going to be exposed to the public, which they should because we're social creatures, then that's going to happen. Uh, I don't know if that's too is – that, is that nihilistic? I don't know. <laughs> Gosh, this got depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so um, I'm going to go devil's advocate the other way now. And then, we'll, and then we're going to go into what we can do about all this stuff, all right? All right. Um, going back to living in Ann Arbor, and, you know, Phoebe says, like, banning books is stupid. And I go, yeah, it sure is stupid. Um, these people who demand that books get banned, I've seen some of their pictures. And they, they, they got weird hairstyles. They're, they're, they're dressed up in, like, 1980s powder blue suits sometimes. Sometimes they're, like, really kooky characters who represent the moral majority or whatever. Um, they're just crazies. Do we really need to pay that? Don't feed the trolls, Dave. Don't feed the trolls. Don't give them any ammunition. Right? Just ignore them. They'll go away. That, that is certainly one uh, one avenue that can be taken. <laughs> and, in, and in many instances, it's the proper response to it is, is to not... not so, sometimes people are clearly... They want attention. Mm-hmm. And this is one way that they, they can get attention uh, put on themselves. And, and as you say, when you feed that attention, it just causes them to to, to go on and on. Uh-huh. And on. Uh, but that's not the only driver. I I think I, I, it's a very complicated issue, and there are many different reasons why somebody might be having the reaction that 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 comes out. This book should not be in the school or the library or available for sale or or mm-hmm. or, or, or whatever approach you're taking mm-hmm. on that. Um, so. And and it's it's hard to to dig in to why why is whatever they're feeling inside coming out and in, in, coming out in this such such a such a manner, and unfortunately we can't all be psychiatrists, right? <laughs> well, but we I can't. like what you're pointing to. You're pointing to empathy. Yeah. You're saying like I'm right. I'm trying to understand your worldview here, bro. Right. While you're saying this stuff. Yeah, yeah. and I, th- I think an an empath trying to have a little empathy. Uh, with that in there saying, yes, I can understand why you would find this disturbing uh, for for a child, um, but but child but children are not the intended audience um, for this. That is why we put it in the adult section of the library, or that is why we've wrapped it in plastic and put it up on a high sh- on the top shelf in the store where where where, where children um, shouldn't be able to get access uh, to it. Um, so so I I think there is there is a there's a little bit of responsibility on behalf of the library and on behalf of the of the store or or whoever to um, to make a judgment on who is the appropriate audience for this and to and to um, and and this is um, and I don't want to call this censorship it's it's selection <laughs> if, <laughs> if you get a room full if you get a room full of, of librarians together is that mm-hmm. there are things that we do not buy for the, for the library because it does not fit in with the collection we have a collection policy for the, for this library we have developed is that, is that policy public um, it should be if you have a good library yeah. um, it, it should be public and available for for people to look at there's um, and so there may be a broad uh, collection policy for the library and there may be specific Policies for particular types of materials. So you might have a, a collection that specifically spells out um, movies, for example. What sort of movies are we going to have? Like we are not going to have um, you know triple X rated films in there. In, We're not going to have snuff know, movies, have stu- snuff movies, or things things like. That. So we will only have G, PG, PG thirteen, mean R rated movies, and uh, minors will need permission from their parents in order to check out an R rated movie. Um, that's a very common policy that, that and but that might not be the case. And I don't know what ADL's policy is on uh, right. On, We're not asking you to speak for ADL. No, 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 no. Um, but I've seen that sort of policy at at different libraries, and it's going to vary from library to library and depending on community and, and community. Well, I mean, that's the glory of living in a democracy where your tax dollars fund your library. You get a say in this stuff. Go to board meetings and raise that, your voice there, right. and vote in the school in the library board uh, yeah. or school board if the school district controls uh, controls right. the library. And in your in your community, and let your let your community standards be known uh, by by the by the library. Yeah, and they they have regular board meetings to listen to you right. on these issues, and, and and they might not agree with you, right? Sure. Right? Sure, they're they're not obliged to do anything about it, right? Um, and and you know, and and let us recall that there is something called a First Amendment in this in this country. Uh, which says that the that the that's gu- the one about guns, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the, that's, that's, no, it's the one that comes before the one about guns, oh. <laughs> which talks about free speech and freedom of the press, and <laughs> and that and that the government will not be um, stepping in and saying what can and can't 
uh, be published. I want to get to that because you linked this morning to a couple of articles that were talking about the rating system that were was enforced for uh, or was uh, attempted at, at DC Comics and it caused like a big you know uh, debate. Right. And uh, what they were trying to do was they were trying to create basically like I guess create like a new kind of comics code where it's like. They, they, they were going to be some. Right. St- well, we should we should probably back up and talk about the comics code a little. Yeah, a little we bit should. For, yeah, because because okay. it doesn't exist today. Right. And ki- kids, <laughs> kids these days, young adults, um, kind of grew up in a world without a comics code. That's weird, is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so so one of the results of of Frederick Wortham's uh, seduction of the innocent and his testimony in front of, of Congress, which was basically blaming comic books for all the ills of for juvenile delinquency and all the ills yes. of thereof. Uh, was that in order to avoid government censorship, um, several publishers banded together and created the Comics Code Authority. This was 1954. Yeah. Yeah, the, the comics industry said, "Look, we'll self-regulate, right. just to keep you guys out of our out of our hair." Right. Yeah. And so they came up with a with a exhaustive list of what cannot be depicted in, in comic. You want to show the comic? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is a this is a 1997 mini comic that Matt Fiesel produced. Uh, it's it's called it's called Comics Code Illustrated. I hold it up there to the thing right yeah. there, and and uh, he got a bunch of his cartoonist buddies to uh, each each. I better show a, a page that can be shown. <laughs> can, well, can, like, can the, be shown here. Yeah, the Sergio right. Aragon is one. We just have to cover yeah. some so, of it up. So here's. Uh, so I'll read it. Uh, restraint in the use of the word crime in titles or subtitles shall be exercised. And the, and then has an illustrated cover of a comic called "Crime and Crime Again." Criminally criminal fun in this issue. Criminals commit incriminating criminal acts of crime, 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 and more crime. So this comic is so much fun. It's a crime. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you got a bunch of cartoons to illustrate, you know, examples of the sorts of things that they were trying to ban yes. <laughs> rather usually rather humorously <laughs> uh, in there the one the one that we won't show is is a, a draw is uh, it was the one of nudity should not be depicted and Sergio Oregones drew this cartoon of, of baby Gru um, a naked baby Gru yes. it's the most adorable thing you've ever is. you've ever seen it's the most adorable naughty thing you've ever seen in your <laughs> yes. life yes <laughs> it's like who could take who could take offense <laughs> To, to that to that depiction there um but um so th- it was like thing after thing after thing of, of the sorts of stuff that you were not allowed to depict in there which was a lot of it had to do with crime and criminals and and um that uh criminals should always be caught in the end and you should not it should not be a manual for how to commit a crime you know, you established should, authority should be shown with respect right in the story right. and there are things about language and sex and nudity and and there were a couple of admirable things in there as well as in you know culture should you know different minority culture should not be shown in a negative light was you know some, something that was that was in the that was in the comics code mm-hmm. um and it was revised in 1971 and again in 1980 something 87 87 per- perhaps that was that was around the time when they when DC did this this right. new change where they wanted to put a rating system right and um wh- one of the th- and most of the major comics publishers signed on to the Comics Code um, at the time. Uh, famously, Dell Comics did not. The publishers of Disney stuff and 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 Warner Brothers stuff and everything. Is it because that their content was self evident? That, that was basically what they that was basically what they said, which is uh-huh. that our internal standards are stricter than this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and we are not going to we are not going to pay money to be part of this thing and submit our comics to that. Yeah. And um, well, one of the ways that they enforced the comics code was most of the newsstand distributors refused to distribute comics that didn't have the comics code seal on them. Right. And they um, and William Gaines said that the other publishers drove him out of business. Uh, that a lot of the things that were written into there were specifically aimed at the best-selling EC titles EC of the, ti- well, of the time. Well, EC title comics were played front and center, uh, uh, you know, w- witness for the process, or for the, for the defense. Right. Uh, they're, they're, they're horror comics and they're crime comics and, mm-hmm. and, and all that. And they had, you know, thrilling crime stories or, or that sort of thing. And here's, here's another example of how censorship can be a dangerous thing, is that Stephen King, arguably one of the most popular authors of the late 20th century, right? Mm-hmm. He did a movie called Creep Show, right? Right. Oh, we're getting some weird feedback, Matt. Oh, interesting. It's like I'm picking up like room noise as well as my mic noise. Anyway, we'll just keep going. All right. All right so well, that's I got to take my headphones <laughs> off. <I can't. laughs> yeah, we're, we're, that is weird. That is weird. We're getting some overdrive, so you can probably lean back from the mic a little bit. Don't be quite so close. Anymore. All right. But um, 
Yeah, that is weird. It's like it's as if my mic's not okay. I, if I get tight on the mic, I still get it. Anyway, sorry folks. Sorry about the the audio snafu. Matt will sort it out. But he does what we call Creep Show. Uh, oh, and, and the audio problem's fixed. Um, <laughs> ah, the old Nina. <laughs> Matt, we just got a new nickname for you. <laughs> He's back there like a one man band, folks. He's got like it's like cymbals and drums and trumpets and everything. And so if he makes one wrong move, like okay. the whole thing comes apart. Anyway, so this movie creep show comes out, and, and it basically is a huge love note to EC Comics. And he even said like his interest in becoming an author began with the EC Comics. Right. Had those comics not been around when he was there to read them, right? We Who might not, we might not have the Stephen King that we have today. That's right. I mean, however you feel about him as an author, right? I mean, he like he made a lot of people happy, right? So anyway. or, or scared the crap out of a lot well, of people. That too. That too. <laughs> so for some, it's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but uh, so th- this whole thing, like, the, and I'll link to the articles that you sent me in the show notes, and this will be at comicsgreat.com slash cag one zero five. You should read them. There's a long interview with Alan Moore, and he said this, and this is what I think was one of the most interesting things. It goes back to something Phoebe said about the act of making the book his explanation enough. Uh, this is an excerpt from the uh, the article about how Alan Moore feels about uh, censorship and enforcing internal guidelines on content. He says, so to me, even though I might object to the warmongering aspects of a book like G.I. Joe, for example, and I love G.I. Joe, but he's right, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's like, but my response to that will not be to try and get a campaign to get G.I. Joe taken off the shelves or put on a higher shelf or put in a plastic bag or given a rating on the cover. My response will be to contribute to something like real war stories, which make me feel that I'm redressing the balance in a positive way, right. rather than trampling over the opposition through sheer brute force. There's right. Alan Moore for you. So that's that's kind of the, the response to art that you don't like is to make art that you do like. Or to support <laughs> or to support art that you do that you do like. But then again you're asking me to do stuff, Dave. I am. <laughs> I'm in. I'm asking you to think about this. Yeah. I, I'm asking you to think about it critically. Yeah. And I'm asking you to to vote with your vote with your votes, vote with your dollars, mm-hmm. um, and to and to, but to not silence other people. Is censorship the the antithesis of being an engaged and active participant? I mean, it seems I, like it's, I I I'm not sure. I don't that's know. An that. inter- that's an interesting question. I don't. Uh, because it certainly is a form of engagement. Sure, but it's right. this kind of engagement. It's it's, it's, it's covering my ear, saying no, 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 no. It's having a reaction to. It's having a reaction to something. Mm-hmm. Um, I I th- I think it's. I, um, I I should point out, folks, that I am speaking as myself and not a representative <laughs> <laughs> of neither the Ann Arbor District Library nor the University, University of Michigan. Michigan. Uh, <laughs> my opinions are my are my own. Oh, that's true. You got to do that. See, that's where I'm in a privileged place as, as, as a cartoonist. It's who like works for you himself. work for yourself. <laughs> I can say whatever I want. I still I still sweat it a lot, but we we can bypass that. But okay, so I'm so, sorry. What was the what the question? I I just kind of threw out this dumb like 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 uh, trumped up. Is, highfalutin is, sound thing is is is, is, is uh, uh, censorship the antithesis of, of engagement? I I in some ways it is. I, I th- but but I think um, when I think the reaction to the call for censorship is perhaps even more important. It can be a it can be a call for engagement. Yeah. Well, perhaps that person is going to put their hands over their ears and la 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 la. I don't. I don't. I, I don't keep want, anticipating I don't where I want to go. <laughs> at, at, at the thing yesterday with with Jim and and Phoebe. Uh, somebody asked a really interesting question that I, I jotted down. I'm like, that's going on the comics are great show. Uh, they asked, you know, how do we reach out to people who react poorly mm-hmm. to or uh, unexpectedly aggressively towards a work? How do we reach out to, you know, uh, start a dialogue with these people? Because if, if they are just covering their ears and saying, no, nobody should see this. It's trash. How do you? Uh, uh, there, there are some people you can't talk to. <laughs> sure, no, it, uh, but 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 I think we should make the effort if if we want to promote comics as a serious art form and as mm-hmm. as a serious medium that is capable of of great profundity and great inanity and all this <laughs> and all the spectrum in, in between there, like all art forms are, yeah. um, that we should that we should want to try to make the effort um, to to engage. Uh, when people are critical of, of the medium uh, that that we love, um, and that we and it has to come from a place of of empathy, um, that that trying to shout down someone who's trying to shout you down just ends up with a bunch of people shouting. 
Oh, it, it's funny that right after that talk, I was walking across the Diag and I'm going back to my car and I see a, a gal walking along and she's talking to her iPhone where like the pizza box style, yeah, just yeah. like, like for some people strike one, <laughs> but, but, uh, but the, she's, she, she's talking very loudly and she says like the difficulty, I, I, I this is like a paraphrasing, but it was, it was essentially the difficulty in spreading Christianity is you can't get through to those people who live that lifestyle. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, yeah, you're shouting that out loud. That freedom of speech. All right. Uh, but, but, um, but like it's like it, it dawned on me as I was walking away. I was like, "Wow, that's the trick: is how to evangelize without being an evangelist, without without being." An, what's the what's the word I want? Well, I, th- there's the word I want. I can't use. <laughs> uh, like, or like, like dogmatic, or or right. uh, or or too brutish about it. Like, well, it's self evident, you idiot. Right? How do you not get what I get? I, the writing's clearly on the wall. It's in big red letters. How come you're so dumb, dummy, that you don't see what's written? That right? Yeah. Uh, you, you keep you, keeping in that mind this this sense of empathy, like understanding where the, where they're coming from, what their worldview is, even, yeah. if, even if they are a little kooky. Yeah, right? yeah. We're all a little kooky. Um, yeah, so so it, it's gosh, we got to make an effort on this stuff. Yeah. That's that's one of the hard things I think about if if you really consider Band Books Week and, and what it means it is that it's not just a an opportunity to say oh people who ban books are stupid. Um, <laughs> it's actually a call for for us to be engaged um, mm-hmm. in in um, in examining our our prefer our art form of choice as as it were, whether it be books or movies or comic books or whatever, and. And be willing to to engage other people. Well, one, one of the things Jim uh, Ardaviani su- um, suggested upon that question is he said that uh, you know he'll take pictures of himself reading banned books and write a little bit about the value that that book brought to his life. And that leads me to the, the event tomorrow. There's an event tomorrow on the campus of Ann Arbor, Michigan. There is, yes, or the University of Michigan, I should say. So I, what what do we got going on? So we're doing a um, so every year for Banned Books Week um, in the past the uh, library, university library, has sponsored a readout on the Diag, mm-hmm. where people will come to a microphone and, and read passages from their favorite banned books. And with this, uh, with this year's theme being uh, comics and graphic novels, we realized that there was a slight challenge in doing, <laughs> doing that, sure, yeah. uh, in that we're talking about a visual, uh, visual medium. Uh, so we're instead, we're having a comics read-in on the Diag tomorrow from noon to one. We're in, we are inviting people to come to the steps of the Hatcher Graduate Library with a comic book mm. and be seen in public reading that comic book. Now, this does not have to be a banned comic or, or a salacious comic or anything. Which we're like going to get to in a second, uh, but, 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 but it could be. It could be if, if you wanted to. And, and uh, we're going to have a, a pop-up library there on the steps with some, with some banned comics from, from the uh, collection of the University of Michigan Library that you can check out. Flaunting your sin. That's right. <laughs> that is right. So, in other words, the University of Michigan's campus is Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just debauchery. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you would be surprised at some of the stuff that has been challenged and banned. And we, we can probably get to that. Well, can, and, we, can we? Can we do uh, that? that so, but, but tomorrow, yeah. if, if you're listening to this live, it's tomorrow. If you're listening to it um, uh, long after the long fact. after that, um, sorry. Uh, so th- that's Thursday, September twenty fourth, noon noon to one. Um, come and support comics by by reading comics in a group of people on the Diag, and we'll talk about comics. And... Oh, and okay, I'll put up. You know, they say that the key to marketing is always make it about the person, right. like what value they'll get out of it. Here's the value you can get out of it. You're a comics person. You're alone. You're special. You read comics. Uh, where are all the other comics people? Here's a gathering. You're gonna meet the other comics people at this thing. Make a friend. Yeah. Make a friend who loves comics. That's so right. There you go. <laughs> and, and so I'm, so I'm, I'm hoping for a big turnout, but it might just be me and three other people out there reading comics. But darn it, we're going to be there. Doing I'll it. be there. All right, so. all right. So there's. Oh wait, 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 wait. One, one to two, n- noon to one. Noon to one. I can do that. Excellent. So <laughs> 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 I got, I got a thing at one, but I can be there for part of it. So all right, awesome. So I'm, I'm at, at the Diag. Uh, or no, in front of Hatcher Graduate Library. So, okay. So, what kind of books can we read at this? What are some banned books? Um, Bone. So, yeah. So, why is Bone banned? If, in some if you go to the CBLDF website, cbldf.org, um, mm-hmm. there's there's they have a page on there of there 22 banned and challenged comics, which uh-huh. are um, either comics that were actually pulled from shelves or that people made requests to not be in a library or not. They're not to be in a school, and the reasons that were that were given, and some of some of them you look at and you're like, yeah, I can see where somebody might not want to to have their child exposed to that sort of sure, sort of thing. yeah, like Charles Burns' Black Hole, I'm not going to give to a six year old, right? Or right. or uh, Necron- the uh, Necronomicon, there sure. neo- was it Neonomicon? 
Yeah, Neil Namakam by Alan Moore and Jason Burroughs, which mm-hmm. which should not be read by children. I will say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would not give that to a child to read. I would not give that to many adults to to read. <laughs> um, and um, but but anyway, then there's stuff like Bone, and 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 you and I are fans of Bone, and yeah. and I've I have. I gave that to to my nephew when he was six years old to to to, to read sort sort of thing, and somebody objected to scenes of smoking in in, in that oh. one of the one of the bone cousins was in the cow costume and smoking a cigar, and and the parent who objected to this was basically saying you know I don't think that depictions of smoking should and, and the drinking too there there's some amount of of villagers hanging out in the bar i guess drink, yeah. drinking drinking beer and that this should not be in a comic for for children um which um is certainly an a, a attitude that one might want to take but i don't but you know people Children, it, it, children see people smoking and drinking. Right? Yeah, that's just it, man. I mean, it's like that's so because it's so not important to the story, right? Right. I mean, it, it's not central to the 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 conflict with the rat creatures and with and the, you know like everybody's backstories that like oh and he smokes right that's right. like central. You know, it's it's such an incidental thing. That's weird. Um. So so there's there's. But I've lived in dry counties before, and I've seen you know how some people can react very viscerally to things like that. So, 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 so it's an interesting list to go through and read the read all the different reasons why people object to certain to certain things in, in comics, and it's really is such a wide spectrum. It, it's going to be from the, from the depiction of, of cultural minorities, or it can be um, stuff that happened in the past that that we don't that we don't. Um, you know that we start, we've we're trying to revise this out of our past, and we don't want our children to be learning about this in school. Or it's sex and drugs and rock and roll, or or um, you know nudity, or um, any wide variety of things. And um, whether take in, they're usually devoid of the context. You know the mm-hmm. uh, for for people complaining about. Well, I want to uh, know the complaint on Mouse. Do you know that? Uh, well, complaint. It's, Is it because it's cartoon characters doing uh, like participating it, but, in World it, War II history? Basically, so let me let me read it here from let's say da, 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 da. Uh, one story is set in the novels. Da, 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 da. Each each race uh, de- each race is depicted as a different animal. Jews are drawn as mice, Germans as cats, Poles as pigs, um, and so um, and. See, so so they were depicted as being anti-ethnic and unsuitable for younger readers. Anti-ethnic? How? I to, to, <laughs> it's not going into detail. Okay, <laughs> not going into much detail here. Uh, but it's often. <laughs> I, I, I could, I could, I could very well be. Oh uh, uh, well, could be. I, so, um, and and and, and yeah, the, I would not say this is suitable for a eight-year-old. But, no, but, but I think that an intelligent fourteen-year-old um, could probably process process Miles. D- didn't Spiegelman win the Pulitzer? He, for that sh- book? he did. He won the Pulitzer won a special Pulitzer Prize for for Miles. Wow. Okay. So yeah, so, I mean... so yeah, and um you know and that's one of the when when they were defending this against the challenge they're like look it won a Pulitzer this is a, this is a serious work of literature here that that we're talking that we're talking about yeah um, and um that that's fascinating that, that so again like you have to wonder are they getting any context in their making these judgments because when you think about it like they won the Pulitzer there is a huge giant 500 pound bag of evidence that this book is culturally important right <laughs> yes <laughs> right Right. This isn't. This isn't about like you know my silly little comic about robot girls having like some kind of uh, you know racial injustices. Right. In so, th- so this is the point where where dialogue and education can come in, come into the play because mm-hmm. you know somebody is having a, a surface reaction to something that they see in, in a comic, and so you can talk about um, in and the the particular person who's making the complaint may not be open to to your arguments in, in your dialogue, but the greater community. Um, probably will probably oh, will be. You remind me. I, I this is something when we talk about um, internet fights, and uh, you know a, a, a case that I like to make, and, and I've seen other people say similar words to this effect is that when there's an internet fight, uh, in my experience, people don't remember exactly what was said. They only remember who really lost their cool. Right. Yeah. You know <laughs> who who descended to name calling and meanness. Right. 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 Um, and so. The trick is, I think, like you're saying, is like, don't be the kid who's like, shut up, dad, you don't get it. <laughs> uh, but to say, like, okay, you may be acting a little irrational. I'm going to try to get through to you. 
and even if I don't get through to you, there may be somebody else listening who I get through to. Right, right. Uh, that's that's a that's an important intangible that we shouldn't lose sight of when we're doing this kind of thing, right? So, right, right. So we got we got off track. We were talking about we were talking about content labeling, and we got yes. we got way off track. <laughs> can we circle back to that? We can, we can. Because <laughs> I was doing research on this yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 in the in the eighties in the in the late eighties, um, DC Comics. Um, Came up with came up with a plan for content labeling uh, for, for their comics, and at the time they had uh, they had started not putting the comics code on certain select comics. Uh, Alan Moore Swamp Thing was was one of the ones that, and was they put for mature readers for, across for the mature top. readers or suggested for suggested for mature readers. Yes, or yeah. so, something so, something yeah, like that sounds right. That and before that they had like sophisticated suspense. And, and yep, I remember that thing, too. Right, yeah. right. And so, um, but uh, so there's basically. At the time, there were basically three sorts of things that DC was publishing. They were publishing stuff with the Comics Code seal on it. Um, they were publishing a few titles without the Comics Code seal on them, mainly because they were direct. They were going only through the direct market, mm -hmm. and so they didn't have to have the seal on it to get newsstand distribution. So they didn't bother submitting them to the Comics Code Authority at the time. Okay. Um, it was New Teen Titans and when they went back. Baxter, Baxter Picture, paper. Yeah, that's right. And Legion <laughs> of Superheroes and the Outsiders and and Infinity Inc. I think were the yes, four, I the remember four that. Titles, yeah, uh, three of which were were then a year later were being published for newsstand sales and then got submitted to the Comics Code Authority after the, after. Oh, I out. did not know that. I was wondering why like Teen Titans came out again later. I remember when I was a kid and I was like, wait a minute, this came out like last year. Why right. am I reading this again? They were doing, this, on they were doing this hardcover paperback release format where it would be released in this upscale format only at the direct sales shops. Oh. And then a year later, they would reprint the stories in, in the newsstand a comic. I learned something. And then there were a handful of titles like Swamp Thing and The Shadow and, and a couple others, perhaps uh, Watchmen. Mm -hmm. um, Dark Knight Returns that had a suggested for mature readers uh, thing on it, and DC had decided that they were going to go to a internal in-house um, content labeling system that would be either uh, it was universal or mature, uh, mature or adult, 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 adult only. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything would have to fall into one of those three categories. And uh, the complaint that Alan Moore and Frank Miller and Marvel, Marvel Wolfman and Howard Chaikin. They, okay. they 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 wrote a letter. Uh, I forget if there's a public. It was a public letter or something that was published in the Comics Buyer's Guide. Mm -hmm. um, and I might be getting the timeline of everything exactly messed up. So, comics historians, please forgive. <laughs> please forgive me on this. Um, that objected to the fact that the creators were not were not um, consulted, consulted in this. And in Marv Wolfman's case, he was an editor at the time, and he was not consulted as an editor. Wow. And, and so he was he was kind of upset about about that as well. And they said that they would not be doing new work for DC once their uh, once their current contracts on stuff ran ran out. Um, mm -hmm. So they were rather publicly and, and uh, Marv Wolfman was fired from his editorial position because as a, because of this. And and uh, I was reading. There's an interview with Dick Giordano, uh, which I think was in the issue after the Alan Moore interview or the issue before. It was it was around that same time. Uh, the Comics Buyer's Guide and the Comics Journal at the time were covering this rather heavily because there was no comics internet in the day. No, I mean there, there was like like uh, CompuServe where you could like get on bulletin boards, but it wasn't widely used. Right, yet. right. Yeah. Um, so so the the news broke much slower, <laughs> and you you could do a five page interview with Dick Giordano about it, you know, and and yeah. not and not a, a thing on you know a one page thing on Newsarama sort of, sort of deal on that. Right. Um, so there was a there was a falderall <laughs> about the, about this content labeling uh, about stuff and um, and um, the vibe I got from what I read was that it had a lot to do with internal standards being right. imposed, imposed upon the authors them. right without their without their input on what those standards should be would be and if you read DC's version of the events versus the creators version of the events as all things are. The, they have two different concerns, and they're they're largely agreeing on ninety percent of the things, and they're disagreeing about the the ten percent. In the, in motivation, motiv we're talking about context right. too, because like uh, a lot of the the question came out of the fact that was this as simple as um what the the fellow who was running Diamond at the time, Diamond Distribution, which right. at the time was like the number one way to get comics, and still is a very very important way to get like monthly comics. Right. Um, basically saying like, "Hey, you guys should make your comics a little bit more decent." And then uh, apparently, like, the, the, yeah, there was there was letters from from prominent. 
comic store owners comic store owners um who were um who were complaining about as you know about about the general state of comics and how they're not like we remembered them when we were when we were kids. Well, and I'll buy I'll buy the argument that like, dude, you guys are putting me in a weird pickle because I run this comic store and suddenly I got these books that I can't give to kids. Right, I can't possibly read this. I, you know, I, I can't possibly read all these comics that are coming out all all the time. That's right. Right. This is the argument that you were making that you were. No, that's right. I mean, right and I th- I think that's actually a valid argument. I can't read everything, so how am I supposed right. to know? Right. Right. And and DC claimed that they were planning this before the letters were published, and the mm-hmm. creators were claiming that it was a reaction to the letters that that were published. Sure. Um, so um, so what what ended up happening is DC ended up not imposing this content rating system they just went back to what they've been doing before which was slapping mature readers on some titles and other titles not having the comics code and and all that flash forward to today mm-hmm. <laughs> the comics code is dead yes. it, it died sometime between 2009 and officially in 2011 is what it, wow that that recently i thought it was longer ago it was um that, that was when the last publisher archie stopped using the com- stopped using the comics code. It was it's, in 2011 it's redundant it's right. moot right but it, but its death began when marvel decided that they were not going to submit their stuff to the comics code and they were going to impose what their own in-house rating <laughs> system <laughs> <laughs> and then DC followed, DC followed suit and other publishers followed suit. And it really, I think, came from the manga publishers. Yep. Who came from, who most of whom came, a lot of them came from the bookstore world, it yep. is, and Tokyo Pop and, and mm-hmm. all of them. And they were slapping ratings on, on their on their comics, whether it was, you know, all ages T for or teen, T, T for teen T for or everyone. Basically, like teen. borrowing a lot from like the video game uh, right. rating systems, right? right. Yep. Yep. And so it's sort of become this non-issue now mm-hmm. that we're just sort of accepting that there will be ratings that all of the media that we consume, television, movies, video games, comic books, everything except for books, everything except for novels, <laughs> right? Wow. Are yeah. going to ha- are going to have this this content rating thing. The following out. program is intended for mature audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. And then they list all the all the wonderful stuff that you <laughs> if this has got nudity. <laughs> It's got adult language. I'm watching this. It sounds uh, great. <laughs> you know, we we're, this is it's obvious we got to have this discussion again to talk, go into this in more detail because another you're bringing up the fact that banning something could also potentially titillate the, 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 stri- the Streisand effect, right? Yes, yes, the Streisand effect, <laughs> right? Which is which was when um when when Barbara Streisand. Um, objected to the fact that there was a photograph of one of her houses that was on some website. It was an aerial ph- photograph of thing, and she didn't want it there. And her act of complaining about it and the publicity involved in complaining about it meant that millions of people went to see this right. photograph. Well, <laughs> like the right to be forgotten thing with right. that fella. I forget, was he in Russia? No. Right. He was someplace, it's not in North America. And he wanted, because he was like the whole EU thing with the whole right to be forgotten law. And uh, by he said, like, th- there was a bankruptcy in my past that I don't want people to have access to and by pointing at that and <laughs> right. saying I don't want people to know about this thing suddenly at, that's the only thing I think it was John Oliver said like now that's the only thing we know about this guy right. yeah. <laughs> so so it's, you know, the act of saying hey this this should not be consumed by people this mm-hmm. it, it's going to cause people to go look at it right yeah you're you're gonna there are a lot of authors who are hoping that their books get challenged. Because that's going to bring this publicity, publicity. To, to to their work, and it's going to sell more. It's going to sell more copies. That that's something I've been kind of secretly hoping in the back of my head is you know we got this book, the Warren Commission report that came out, and like some of the the discussions I've had with friends, like are you worried about conspiracy theorists, and that's kind of coming at you. I'm like, I kind of hope they do. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they all buy it to rail against it. <laughs> yeah, I just I just want one guy. I want like Bill O'Reilly to go like, this is trash, and then I can go, yay, we made a lot of money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, but the, the, the unintended, the unintended effects of of rating systems and censorship and and banning books is that it doesn't necessarily do what you want it to do. Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, we only have so much control over that, right? That's right. Um. So, but but it is. I I I think the 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 big takeaway for me is that it is upon us. As I'm going to be really corny, I'm going to say, like, as Americans, <laughs> you know, to get involved in. I'm going to put on my, my Uncle Sam from the Freedom Fighters hat. Uh, but it's, it's kind of upon us to get involved in these kind of discussions. It's upon us to get involved with our local constituencies and not just scream to the mayor, like, hey, I don't like this thing. You know, um, not, not necessarily like observe the chain of command, but. There, there are people who you can talk to before you make a big, explosive fuss about it, right? Uh, there are reasonable people who are willing to listen to you. Right. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I know that I, I don't know. Again, I'm not speaking for ADL, but I know that they do have their own policy about challenge books and they put people on it to review the challenge and, and, and discuss it with people. And they've, they've got a system in place for that. So you have avenues outside of screaming bloody murder about it. And on the other side, if you are a person who loves comics, whether you make comics, whether you you know collect comics or whether you're a librarian about comics, it's also upon you to defend you know uh, the works that get challenged. And sometimes it's hard to defend those things. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Like when we were talking about, like you know, like I don't have any issues of cherry in my house, and I would never. You know, it's not something I'm even remotely interested in. But uh, First Amendment, dude, we get that guy gets to make those comics, even if I don't like them. You know, and if I don't like them, I get to make comics that propose an alternate point of view. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like you know why do you why do you defend Playboy magazine or or, or whatever? It's it's like so we don't have to defend Newsweek. Yes. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Right. That's a terrific way of putting it. So, so um, sometimes we're placed. Sometimes we're placed in the uncomfortable position of defending stuff we don't like. Yes. And um, and so we don't have to be friends to be allies, right? Right. Right. So uh, I think that's another thing that we forget sometimes. We think that we got to be buds to all be on the same team. No, no. I mean, it. it like the thing I think about the, the division in my mind is is like I don't have to like you very much to believe that you are a fellow. Uh, you know, cartoonist uh, advocate. Right. And if you are a cartoonist advocate, I will forgive a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, All right. So, so we could go yes, on and on we and could, on, but we're already this. over we, time. We have barely, we have barely scratched the surface of this, folks. So, um, if if you are listening or watching, and you think this was great, I would love more of this. Let us know. And a way to let us know is you can follow Dave Carter on Twitter, Dave Reads Comics. Yes, right? Dave, Dave Reads Comics. And you can at tweet him. I'm Jersey on Twitter. You can at tweet me. Uh, you can comment on the YouTube video or on the Google Plus uh, uh, event page. Um, you know, let us know. We would love to do more of this. Uh, we would love to have you guys part of that discussion uh, because, yeah, there's, there's. I basically got through a third of my notes. I, and I, we, we've barely scratched the surface of. Of this entire topic, so yeah. ma maybe someday we can we can pick up where we've left off. We will, we will, right. and we'll bring in more voices on this. I'd yes. love to get like Larry Martyr in here from the right. Comic Book Legal Defense Fund oh, yeah. to talk more about it. So, action items: uh, go to the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Uh, CBDLF. CBLDF. CB CBLDF. Dot com. Dot org. Dot org. Dot org. Nonprofit. Yes, you can donate to them and write it off on your taxes. Probably talk to your accountant. <laughs> yeah, I think they're a five hundred one three C. Yeah, they are. So, yep. um, and and then also, if you're in the Ann Arbor area, go to the read in tomorrow, uh, from noon to one in front of Hatcher Graduate Library, and uh, it's, it's going to be a gorgeous day tomorrow. Yeah, it is. Sunshine, seventy to seventy five degrees. Perfect day for it. It is. It's a great then, day to read comics and public. And then you can go to Pinball Pete's afterwards, or you can go to the Duderstadt and play some video games there. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, also, you know, when, when you encounter these discussions happening and people saying, why are people reading this trash? It's, it's upon you to get involved in a thoughtful and empathic way. Try to understand where they're coming from. Try to patiently under explain, even if you don't, even if they don't get it, somebody else might. So that's how we make comics uh, a more widely read medium. So thanks, Dave. Thank you, Jersey. Uh, this was fun. I, I I did have fun. I thought this was going to be all grim, but it was actually a pretty fun discussion. So, all right. Uh, this show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG105. Uh, if you enjoy the show, you can, uh, you know, thank the show by giving it a thumbs up on YouTube if you're watching the video. If you're listening to it on, uh, you know, your podcatcher, you know, give it a review on iTunes. However, just a star review. You don't have to write a review, but you could write a review. We just, you know, however many stars you think the show deserves, that helps more people find the show. And uh, thank you to Matt DeBay and Al in the control room for, uh, you know, stringing this thing together over and over and over again. I know I'm prematurely aging you, Matt, and I apologize. <laughs> and thanks, Dave Carter of... Uh, Dave Reads Comics on Twitter. Uh, what other site should we point to? That's enough. You can find me okay. there. <laughs> All right. Twitter's, Twitter's where you're most active. All right. So until next time, everybody, thanks for downloading, watching, and listening. I've been Jersey Drozd of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.